Hello, hello. We are here today with uh, Professor Paul Kivela, who is a big shot in emergency medicine in the US. He is a professor at the University of Alabama and a past president of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Paul, good morning. Hi, good morning. Hey, thanks for having me here. You can see that we have about the same decoration here because we are both in the same hotel in Turkey at an international meeting on emergency medicine. And so it's a pleasure to have this short conversation. And I would like to ask you, Paul, um, you know, to, to tell us a little bit about the U.S. situation. How would you characterize in general, U.S. is a big country, but in general, the relation between emergency room physicians and ICU physicians or intensivists, as we call them here, would you speak about harmony, good atmosphere, or would you speak rather about competition? Well, I, I think there's uh, always the good and the bad. And, you know, certainly as the president of American College of Emergency Physicians, we dealt with some of the challenges between our organizations. Uh, my year, we started meeting and we meet annually, but only one time a year with the Critical Care Medicine Association. And certainly we have our differences and they continue. Um, so there's a little bit of turf back and forth. And I, I think, you know, uh, hopefully as we go forward, we can uh, smooth out those relations even more. But in general, our relationship is very good. We're a good team. Uh, okay. between the two of us. What about on, on, on the ground in the, in the hospitals? Uh, is there usually a good relation or is it sometimes a bit tough? Uh, sometimes it can be a bit tough. Uh, there, there is uh, some questions, you know, certainly the ICU beds are full across the United States, even before COVID. And now with COVID, it's, it's worse. So oftentimes those ICU patients back up into the emergency department. So, you know, at times things can get kind of afraid of, of why, it, why is every, all the ICU patients backing up into the ER. Although you are the country with the largest number of ICU beds per inhabitant, aren't you? Uh, that is my understanding, but it, it certainly doesn't seem that way, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the ICU doctor goes to the emergency department when he or she is called, right? And then what happens? Usually it goes well or, uh, or do, do they not come to the emergency department, or, but over the phone they say, okay, you can send us the patient. How does it work usually? Yeah, I guess it depends a little bit from, from hospital to hospital, but yeah. generally... They, they call from the phone. Uh, they oftentimes do not come down to the emergency department or they send their nurse practitioner or their PA. Those are kind of physician extenders. And then they may sometimes criticize what you have done. Uh, can it happen? And uh, no, you didn't treat this patient well and not fast enough? Of course, and, and you know, we, we talked about this before, but certainly with sepsis and the one hour profile, you know, oftentimes patients don't even get to the emergency department from triage in an hour. So it makes it kind of frantic at times. Yeah, indeed, we want to go into, uh, into sepsis. And uh, uh, the, in Europe, we are, usually we have uh, uh, real hesitations about the one hour bundle. It may be too long, it may be too short. And uh, we feel it's a US thing, uh, but that's debated in emergency medicine in the US, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, in general, the emergency physicians across the, across the U.S. are not in favor of the one-hour bundle. We think it leads to a lot of problems. And we don't think that the literature bears out uh, the use of a one-hour bundle, certainly not a strict one. Because in Europe, we also consider that there is a risk of uh, excessive administration of broad-spectrum antibiotics right away, perhaps under some form of medical legal pressure. People are afraid to miss sepsis and they give antibiotics to everyone coming in with a little bit of fever. I, I totally agree with you. I think the majority of emergency physicians in the United States would completely agree with you. And that's uh, something we oftentimes differ with the Society of Critical Mer Care Medicine in the US. Yeah, and um, it, maybe some elements in, in the bundles actually could be applied within less than one hour, I'm thinking at the correction of profound hypotension or starting fluids or measuring lactate. It doesn't take one hour to do that. What, what would you say? Oh, I, I agree with you on that. I think, you know, if a patient's hypotensive, they're critical, 
certainly, you know, we need to do whatever we can and resuscitate them as soon as possible. And hopefully that's within minutes and not measured in hours, you know, but some of these other aspects of the one hour bundle, I'm not sure are, are really the best thing for our patients. Yeah, right. In the field of trauma, we abandoned the golden hour concept, right? Because sometimes it, it was not applicable or it actually resulted in some delays because people felt that they had one hour to do some important things, right? That, that's correct. You know, I think, you know, trying to make everybody fit into a certain package is, is very difficult and, and sometimes creates unintended consequences. Now, you also told me yesterday that uh, uh, sometimes the, the ICU doctors, when they come to see a septic patient, give too much fluid. Is it correct? Or is it the emergency room physicians who give too much fluid? Or how, how does it work? It can be a combination of both. You know, I think sometimes maybe we don't go to pressors fast enough. Maybe we don't give steroids fast enough. But certainly, you know, the whole idea of the 30 cc per kg it feel a lot of times our people feel compelled to give that where the person's, you know, borderline hypotension. Um, and sometimes that leads to problems. So we've seen quite a bit in the US of fluid overload uh, from just being overly aggressive on IV fluids. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, again, in Europe, most people are against this idea of giving a fixed amount of fluids. We need to individualize fluid administration. Now, what kind of monitoring would you use in the ER? Do people use echocardiography routinely? Uh, that's coming. Um, actually, at the previous conference, I had one of the uh, other uh, colleagues in my department talk about you know, using ultrasound and echo. Uh, to judge fluid resuscitation. And I think that's, that's coming. You know, that's a very small percentage of emergency departments in the U.S. can do that right now. But I, I'm hoping as ultrasound becomes more prevalent and uh, echo becomes more of a standard in the, in the ER that we are doing it that way. Do you see some other easy to apply monitoring techniques uh, for now or for the next future? Well, I, I think, you know, that's something that we all need to talk about is what is the standard of care? You know, I'm, I'm hesitant to say this is what we're going to do. Um, I think it, that's why it's uh, conferences like this um, and sharing of ideas really makes, I hope, as we go forward, a better result in the end. Mm -hmm. So in, in the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Committee now, it's already very large, the 60 people, and there are people coming from all over the world. But there is no emergency doctor in this uh, in this campaign, right? Yeah, that that's really the problem here. You know, they a lot of times the critical care medicine points to some uh, emergency physician in Europe, and unfortunately, uh, that doesn't always apply the same way into the U.S. So I think as we go forward, I'd love to see uh, an emergency physician from the U.S. on this committee. I think it would uh, probably help uh, guide our outcomes and better make this a universal way of treating patients. Well, Paul, thank you very, very much. I think our time is over, but this was very interesting. We very much enjoyed talking to you. I'll see you later at the meeting. Take care. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.